All right, let's read uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Entitle this message, What We Know. What We Know. The scripture here says the knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now, which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Last week, this Sunday, we went over this matter of Paul rebuking the apostle Peter for his, his conduct. He said that uh, in verse 14, when he saw he walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. Remember, Peter was fellowshipping with the Gentiles, some Jews walked in, and for fear of these Jews, fear of offending them, he was eating something that was contrary to the law of Moses. And what he did is he pushed that away. He separated himself to be with these Jews. And in doing so, he caused others to follow him, his conduct. And Paul said he walked not uprightly. The word is uneven. His is profession was that salvation was by the grace of God. And you remember he had written that lengthy letter to the churches at Antioch saying that we were that the Jews were saved in the same manner as the Gentiles which was by grace. And he said why are we putting the yoke of the law that we and our fathers could not bear back on the Gentiles? And yet now he's by his conduct, he is giving consent that the law is necessary. The law was necessary. It was a great error. And Paul confronts him here. But I want you to take notice of how the apostle confronts him. He doesn't run up and say, Peter, you heretic. It's not what he says. He does it in such a manner of love. And he, he does it by talking to Peter concerning what we know. Now listen to his language. He said uh, in, in verse 14, he said, I've said before Peter, before them all, if you being a Jew live after the man of the Gentiles as not as do the Jews, why are you compelling the Gentiles to live like the Jews? Now you don't live like the Jews. You believe that salvation is by grace. You don't believe like the Jews concerning the law of Moses being necessary. Then why in the world by your conduct are you compelling people to go back under the law? That's a good question, isn't it? He's not asking it for, to, to, to make feel, Peter feel bad. I'm just trying to tell him. Answer the question, Peter. It's very important. And then he says... We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the, like the Gentiles. What is he saying like that? He's saying, I'm not saying the Jews are not without sin. He's saying, look, if we who are Jews by nature and not people who never knew the law, the Gentiles, they had no clue what the law said about pork sandwiches. Not a clue. They didn't, they didn't know much about the law at all. Why? Because they weren't raised under the law. Peter... And Paul were raised under this law. And so now he comes to Peter and he said, this is what we, listen, this is what we know. Let's just go back over what we know. And the question is this. How can we who are truly sinners, 
who have truly transgressed the law of God be absolutely justified before God? You that believe in Christ, you know the answer. You do. And when I give you this answer, you, you understand this. You know this. I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know. He didn't tell Peter anything Peter didn't already know. Are we justified by law or by faith? How are we justified? In verse 16, he sets these two in opposition. I thought this interesting. Uh, this was said, and I, I didn't count it myself, so if you want to count it. I think so, someone said that it, uh, the word justified was mentioned over 16 times, about 16 times in the New Testament. Three of those times are in this one verse. Knowing that a man is not justified by the law, but by the faith of Christ, even we that believe in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Three times he's talking about the word justified. Justified. And he says, how then are we justified? He sets these two in opposition. I think this is the... The moment, this is like a key moment in this book because he, he's, he's laying out what he's going to do here. He's going to set these two in opposition because these two are oil and water. They cannot be mixed. They just can't be mixed. He sets these two in opposition. Either you are justified by faith or you are justified by law. And so the first thing he sets forth is what we know. We know this, that a man is not justified by the works of the law. That's something we know. That's something we know. A man is not justified by the works of the law. Then how? If a man is not justified by the works of the law, how is he justified? Well, we know something else. That he is justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. This is how a man is is justified. This is common knowledge for everyone born of God. We know something. We know that we're not justified by the law because we're born dead. We're born dead in sins. What does the scripture say about us? Wherefore is by one man sin entered the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for all have sinned. We know this. This is why we can't be justified by the law because we were born in sin. The wicked are estranged from the womb speaking lies. We came forth. Nobody taught us to lie. We knew that. By nature we were liars. Isaiah said from the sole of the foot even to the crown of the head there is no soundness but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. And so then we know this, that no man is justified by the law because there's, it's impossible. You've already broken it before you even get here. So how then could we ever obey it? It's an impossibility. And what does the law promise? What are the promises of the law? Do this and live, or don't do this and die. That's the law. The law promises death to all who do not obey it completely. Yet because we are born in sin, we are all sinners from birth, corrupt by nature, the law only promises us what? Cursed. Paul describes this in, in the third chapter. He says, for as many as are of the works of the law are under what? Under the curse. Under the curse of the law. Because that's all the law can do for us is curse us. It can't help us. So then, all would who would even in part be justified by the law or live by the law are under the whole curse of the law. The law cannot be divided, friends. This is, this is the, the fallacy of a of, of very intellectual and highly intellectual men. I, dare, I know that many of these men are so much higher educated than I am. But they divide the law. They take the law in its sections. They say, okay, this is dietary law, 
and then this is the ceremonial law, and this is the governmental law, and this is the moral law. How many laws are there? One. It's all one law. It was all given at Sinai. And what is the result of this law? The law says, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in, listen, all things, written in the book of the law to do them. This is the first thing the Holy Spirit convinces us of, isn't it, of sin. And listen, how does God convince us of sin? The law. The law. The law is useful and necessary. The law has a use. Paul said in uh, Romans chapter 7, he says, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came. Now wait. Paul, you didn't know the commandment before it came. You, he didn't. He, he could recite it. He, he even said, I, he even thought he did it. But when it came in power, when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. That's our experience. You that believe, that's your experience. You, knew, you only knew you were dead when the law said, came in in power. And when we were quickened, we saw our depravity. We felt our depravity. Depravity was not a doctrine anymore. It was personal. You see, I knew about total depravity long before I knew I was totally depraved. But when the, sun, when the law came in power, I knew that. I was totally depraved. I didn't know about anybody else. I knew I was. We feel God's holy demands and our inability in the flesh to ever achieve it. But in the same hour of grace, God sent, in, it sent his gospel as to how God could be just and justify an ungodly rebel. And Paul mentions that in their text. Look at that. Knowing a man is not justified by the works of the law, how is a man justified? By the faith of Jesus Christ. Christ by the faith of Jesus Christ this is not speaking about our faith in Christ this is not the only time the apostle uses this phrase the faith of Jesus Christ look at Romans chapter 3 Romans chapter 3 And look at verse 22. He says, even the righteousness of God is by what? The faith of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9. Paul says, he, in verse 8 he said, Yea, doubtless I count thing, all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. I was thinking about how to, how to illustrate this to you. If, if you brought me food, I would say the food is of you. It's of you. You brought it. You made it. You gave it. It's of you. Now, when I eat it, or you tell me you're bringing it, then I can believe that in you, I can believe that you are bringing it to me, that I believe you prepared it. I believe you made it. And when I eat it, you know, that's, that's the consummation of it. You see, our faith in Christ is necessary. You must believe in Jesus Christ. But believing in Jesus Christ is simply receiving something that Christ has already done for us. So this is not speaking of our faith in Christ. Look back at your text. He said that we're justified by the faith of Christ. Then he mentions our faith. Listen to this. Even we have believed in 
Jesus Christ. Why? Because believing in Jesus Christ is the evidence of our justification. No one can claim to be justified without believing in Jesus Christ. But believing in Jesus Christ did not merit the justification. He simply received it. It didn't merit it. So where is the merit of your justification? It is the faith of Christ. The faithfulness of Jesus Christ. A preacher wrote this, I thought it was good. Christ as our head, our surety, our representative, obeyed the whole precepts of the law and suffered the whole penalty of the branches of it by his death. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law by being made a curse. And Christ's obedience and death being set forth by God himself for a propitiation. Nothing can be more plain and satisfactory than we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of all our sins according to the riches of his grace. You see, our Justification was accomplished by the obedience and the death of Christ alone as a surety and as a representative. That's how our justification was merited. It was merited by Jesus Christ. Believer, therefore, knowing that our justification was accomplished by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, let us by faith seek only to be justified by Christ. Faith only wants to be justified by Christ. Is there any, any other thing you want any other thing you want to be justified by? I want to be justified by Christ. That's why Paul said, I count all things but dung, that I may win him, that I might be found in his righteousness, not my righteousness. Faith looks to his faith. Faith looks to his obedience. And what do we do? We turn our back to the law for any guidance and help in this matter of justification. The law cannot guide me to justification. The law cannot do anything to help me. And I want you to know this. If the apostle Peter can be attempted to turn back from the law, to turn aside from the gospel of grace, so can we. We all can. This is why this is written for us. This is why it's here. For our instruction. If Peter could do it, how much more are we prone to adopt the law as a guide for our life, which was never its purpose? The law is not a guide. The law is not a suggestion. Listen to this one. The law is not an exhortation. The law is a demand. It's a just and righteous demand to all who are under it. If you are under the law, everything the law demands of you is right. And just. The problem is you can't do any of it. Not one thing. There is not one thing in the law that we personally have ever fully satisfied. Nothing. And Peter, before this, in great boldness, proclaimed the truth concerning the gospel of God's grace, yet in weakness he was overcome by temptation and entangled again by the yoke of bondage. He was entangled in this bondage that he knew was no means of justification. That's what Paul is reminding him of. Peter, you know this. You know the law is no means of justification. You know the only means, Peter, is this. We are justified by the faith of Christ. Isn't that why we believe in Christ, Peter? That we might be justified by the faith of Christ? It is. And 
And so how foolish is Peter and how foolish is anyone who would ever seek to be justified by the works of the law that would revert back in any measure to the law for acceptance or merit. It's just foolishness. The law of God, friends, has only one purpose, and that is to expose sin. That's it. The law must be used lawfully. And that's, that's what its purpose is. In the same book, in Galatians 3 and verse 19, he said, wherefore then serveth the law? Well, Paul, if, we're not, if the law has no part in this, then what in the world is the purpose of the law? He says this, it was added for the transgression. In another place, he said that sin might appear exceeding sinful. That's it. The purpose of the law is to expose sin. And then, then he says, is, law, is the law against the promises of God? God forbid it's against the promises of God. Why? Because if there was a way to be justified by the law, then we should have. But here's the conclusion of the law. All under sin. Now you look at the law, that's all it's going to tell you. Sinner. Sinner. Guilty. 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 That's all it can say to you and me. That's all it can say. It can only curse. But herein is the promise of the gospel. A justification by the faith of Christ is given to all that believe. This is a glorious truth, isn't it? That the justification of Christ is given freely given without merit without works that's the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ that Christ by his own faith and obedience merited our justification and then in free grace gives his justification to us and by grace we receive it through faith and we are what? justified now what does justified mean? That means you're without sin. That's what that means. It means you're innocent. It doesn't mean that like you're innocent. No, you are. God doesn't, doesn't, doesn't deal in pretend. God doesn't, well, you can say, you're justified. No, that's not how he does it. You that believe in Christ, you are justified. You are free from all your sin. Why? Christ justified you. Christ did it. And so now Paul reveals the consequence of legalism. Go back. He said he tells us what we know. We know we're not justified by the law. How are we justified? We're justified by the faith of Christ. And what's the, what's the grace of this? That God has given us faith. We believe in it that we should, might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law. Why? For the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But, Alan, he's going to confront this matter of the consequence. Now Paul, he's talking to Peter again. Now Peter, if you put this out there, now listen. He said, but if, listen, but if, we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid for if I build again the things that I destroy, I make myself a transgressor. He said, look, if we seek to be justified by the faith of Christ, and yet when we go back under the law, what does the law make us? The law makes us sinners. It condemns me. It condemns me. So then, is Christ the minister of condemnation? No, the law is the minister of condemnation. Christ is the minister of justification. The Christ is the minister of salvation. In Christ, there is therefore now what? No condemnation. Isn't that totally opposite of what the law says? The law says you are condemned. Christ says you are not condemned. 
So now then, if I'm being justified by Christ and I go back under the law, then Christ is what? Uh, if that's the way Christ intended it, then he's a minister of condemnation. He said, no, God forbid he's not a minister of condemnation. Why? If I destroy, for if I build again the things that I destroy, I make myself a transgressor. If I go back under the law, which I destroy by my disobedience, The law is not, there's no, is there anything wrong with the law? No. I destroyed all hope of being saved by the law because I'm a sinner. I destroyed it. Burn the bridge. There's no way to get across by the law. I did it. But if I try to build it again, what am I doing? I'm going back under the sentence of condemnation. I make myself a transgressor. And so justification by the faith of Christ and justification by the works of law, listen, they cannot coexist. They cannot coexist. The believer in Jesus Christ is justified without doing the works of the law, and all those who seek to add the works of the law, you are not justified at all. Why? Because you made yourself a sinner. You've brought back condemnation. You've rejected grace and you've brought to yourself condemnation. Now the legalist says that faith in Christ, and I want you to understand the true nature of a, of a legalist, somebody who wants to go back under the law. They're saying in some measure Christ is not sufficient. They're saying that in some measure. The Roman Catholic Church, they, they say Christ not sufficient in righteousness and, and redemption and justification or sanctification. They got to contribute. He did some of that for them, but not all of it. They have to contribute. The Reformed doctrine says that Christ is our righteousness, our justification, our redemption, but we must be our sanctification. And I didn't say all of it. They, they do hold that Christ has some measure of sanctification, but yet they believe that they must sanctify themselves. They must have some part in it. In other words, Christ's sanctification was not sufficient. I must do my part. I must add something of my obedience and my service to him, to his work. And so then they try to keep some aspect of the law. And what do they call us? Lawless. They call me an antinomian. They call me a lawless man. They lay this charge to anyone who preaches the gospel of God's grace. So then, if we who have fled to Christ alone for our justification return to the law, then Christ is a minister of condemnation, which he's not. Paul says, God forbid. God forbid. We who believe in Christ. We are rejecting the law for any part of our salvation. And we lay all of our salvation totally and completely dependent upon Jesus Christ. Christ is all my righteousness. Christ is all my wisdom. Christ is all my sanctification. Christ is all my redemption. He's all of it. We lay all on him. We trust fully in him. Now, believers, do we have any contempt for the law? Absolutely not. The law is good. There is nothing wrong with the law. But rather, I despise the misuse of it, making th men think that they can be justified or sanctified by it. That's misuse of the law. And look at verse 18. Paul uses this strong language. If I build again the things that I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. If I go back to the law, we cannot, 
we, we know that the law cannot save. We turn from justification by the faith of Christ. We are now transgressors and guilty before God with no hope. But for us who believe, being free from the law is a good thing. Isn't it? We sing that hymn, and I love to sing it. Free from the law, oh happy condition. Jesus has bled and there is remission. Cursed by the law. Bruised by the fall. Here's my hope. Christ hath redeemed us once for all. That's my hope. This is the hope of every believer. Is that we who have fled to Christ, we destroy all hopes of ever returning to the law. I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back to the law. The law can only condemn me. We have burned all our bridges concerning the law. I think of Christian on that hill of difficulty. He had a lot of trouble. He looked forward and there was nothing but difficulty, nothing but trouble. But I know this. He could not turn back because there was only death there. He knew on the other side, Zion was there. And so where did he go? He pressed forward. He pressed forward. And so do we. We don't want to return because there's only death where the law is concerned. Therefore, Paul says, we are not come to Mount Sinai, the mountain that burned. But we are come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, to the new Jerusalem, to Jesus Christ, the mediator, to just men made perfect by the faith of Christ. Therefore, by God-given faith, we see this. Look at the next verse. For I, through the law, am dead to the law. I, through the law, am dead to the law. The question then would be raised, if I'm not justified by the law of God, but by the faith of Christ, then are we justified by some other standard than the law? No. No, the law is the standard. The law is the standard. Paul said, I'm not justified by another standard. He said this, I through the law, not around the law. God didn't skirt the law. God saved us through it. Through the law, I'm dead to the law. We are not justified by some other law, but by the law that we could not be justified by our works. When sinners destroy the law by rejecting it as a covenant by which he is made righteous before God by fleeing to Jesus Christ by faith. We destroy the law by making it obsolete because of this. Christ has already fulfilled it for me. See, I didn't skirt the law. I'm not going to be saved by skirting the law. I'm going to be saved through the law. Why? Because my representative and my federal head subjected himself to obey the law of God for me. I like this idea of federal head. Don't you? A federal headship. I like this. Most men don't. When you talk about Adam as a federal head. Men hate it. They don't like to hear that Adam was a federal head. When Adam sinned. We all died in him. Well they say. Well that's not fair. Like they could have done better. Adam was the best of us wasn't he? Yeah. He was the best of us. And he failed. Adam was our federal head. This is why us and all of our children are born dead in sin. Because of him. But the reason I like a federal head is not because of Adam, because of Christ. Because what Christ did as my federal head, everything he did, he did in my place. He did for me. When Adam sinned, it was though I sinned myself. When he sinned. Therefore when Christ came and performed righteousness. It was as though I myself did it. When Christ suffered under the wrath of God for my sins. Suffered under the law. I in Christ suffered 
the wrath of God. The law is of no use to the believer in this matter of salvation, which includes justification, <coughs> sanctification, and redemption. But behold, we who believe in Jesus Christ are saved not apart from the law, just apart from our own obedience to it. For Jesus Christ, by his faithful obedience to the law, has accomplished all that the law requires, and we accomplished it by virtue of our union with him. Listen, what, listen how Paul says it. I'm dead to the law, through the law, that I might live unto God. For, he said, I am crucified with Christ. You see that? This is how he was dead to the law, through the law. Is it Jesus Christ, he died when Christ died. When he was crucified, when he was suffering the wrath of God, we too were suffering the wrath of God in our federal head. I am crucified with Christ. And yet here's the joy. Nevertheless, I live. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. But Christ liveth, listen, in me. We talk a lot about being in union with him, and we are. But do you realize he is in union with you? He is in you. He is. By his Holy Spirit, by virtue of his new the new nature that he created in each one of us, that holy nature, he resides in union with us. I in you. I, I'm trying to think of that exactly how he put that in John 17. What? Uh, Oh, man, now it just floated through my head. He said in verse 21, that they, may be, uh, that they all may be one as thou fathered in me, and I in thee, that they may be one in us. This union that we have in Christ is, is, is mysterious. It is. I cannot by my actions be closer to God than I am if I'm in union with Christ. Can you get any closer to God? Now we can feel closer. I mean, we like that. I mean, there's nothing. I, I, I enjoy that when God gives us these these wonderful feelings of our union with him. There are times where we're exalted like Paul up, up high. We feel, we feel as though we can reach and taste heaven. But there are times we live in most, mostly we live in times where we cannot feel those things. Well, are we, in, are we less close to God when we can't feel it? Why? Because we are one with him. We are in union with him. The scripture says he cannot deny himself. How often do you fail in believing? Here's my hope. He cannot deny himself. Can't deny me. Because to deny me is to deny himself. I'm in union with him. I was crucified with him. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live, how do I live? By what rule? By what law? The life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live believing and trusting in the faith of the Son of God. That's where my life is hid. That's where my hope is hid. It's in him. I live by the faith of the Son of God. Listen to this. Who loved me. Who loved me. How long has...
has he loved you? Was there ever a time he did not love you? How do I know he loves me? He gave himself for me. He suffered the full measure of God's wrath, satisfying the law of God for me. Now, is the law for a righteous man or a sinner? If Christ has made me righteous, then what has the law to do with me? Nothing. I thought, you know, you know, speed limit 55. What if your car could never go over 55? Would that would you need a sign? Would you need a sign? No, you would never need a sign. It wouldn't, you couldn't do it. Impossible. The law has nothing to say to us, friend. Why? Because our Savior has already honored it. He did what we could not do. And to take that law back to ourselves is to dishonor him. It's not to honor him. Now, Peter, with all sincerity, thought he was honoring God. I don't doubt that. When he pushed away, I bet he felt holier. I bet he felt better about himself. Those Jews came in and scowled, and he pushed it away, and he goes, you're right, guys. You're right. I repent. I feel better about myself. I'm sure with all sincerity that he really believed he was honoring God. But Paul was saying this, no, you have dishonored Christ. You've dishonored Christ. Why? Because Christ has forever satisfied the law of God in every aspect. And what's the evidence then of my justification? It is my faith. I live by the faith of the Son of the just. How shall the just live? Look at verse chapter 3 and verse 11. But no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. That's how we live. Daily, moment by moment, looking to Jesus Christ. Look at that next verse. And the law is not of faith. See, it don't mix. Just don't mix. We live by faith in Jesus Christ. And this last verse here. Look at verse 21. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. I do not disannul the grace of God. What Peter was doing was disannulling the grace of God. That's what he was doing. Paul says, I don't do it. I don't do it. If we're to go back under the law, if that's the case, if that's the, really the case, then Jesus is dead in vain. I do not disannul the grace of God. For if the righteousness come by the law, if any measure of righteousness, any, a, a, just a little bit comes from the law, then Christ is dead in vain. In other words, there's no hope for us. What he's saying. If there's any measure of righteousness that comes by the law, there's no hope for us. And Christ's death is empty. Now we know that's not true. We know that's not true. Christ was not, did not die in vain. We cannot frustrate the grace of God. And we don't do it. We know this, that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Something we know. That's just what we know. How is a man justified by the faith of Christ? By his obedience, by his blood, by his righteousness. 
even we believe in Jesus Christ for that reason, that we would be justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. Why? Because by the works of law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Now, if we do that, if we do take the law again, then Christ has become a minister of condemnation, and that's not true. Christ is not a minister of condemnation. Christ is a minister of justification. He's a minister of salvation. So we do not dare try to rebuild what we destroyed. If I do that, then I'm a, I'm a sinner, and there's no hope for me. What's my hope? My union with him. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. I'm not going to disannul it, Peter. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. You're either under grace or under the law. There is no mixture here. I am very thankful to be under the grace of God, not the law. I just, I, I, every time I read it, it, it just condemns me. It just does. And if I don't see it as it was intended, seeing Christ's obedience in the law, then I've misused it. Misused it. I pray that God would bless this to our hearts. Let's stand and be dismissed. I'm thankful he gave us the time to be together and allowed me to finish preaching. I was, I'm very thankful. Very thankful. Gracious Father, dismiss us with your mercies. I thank you for your mercy tonight. You were very gracious and kind. I pray that you would keep us, strengthen us. Let us see that Christ is all. That Christ is all. And I do pray that you would cause us to see his love and his mercy and the offering of himself. To see the full salvation that he has accomplished for us. You might give us peace in our hearts. And I ask you to do this in his name.